I think we are on the record. So let's start this lecture and this is lecture number three. And today's plan is to talk about real number systems or the set of real numbers, a brief overview, if you want to call it. Uh, then I'll introduce some basic geometry on 2D and 1D. And lastly, I'll talk briefly about polynomials. That's the plan for today's lecture, basically. So let me get started by defining real numbers. Real numbers are numbers that you use, use or see in your day-to-day -day life, like 1, 2, 1 1.5, 1.33, minus 2, da, 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 so on and so forth. And if you take a collection of all these numbers, then you can form a set, and that is called the set of real numbers or the set of reals. So, uh, if we take a collection of these numbers, then we can form a set which is called the set of reals or the set of real numbers and it's denoted by this bold face r so whenever you see this symbol that means the set of reals it's indicating that uh, you're dealing with a set of real numbers okay <clears throat> so this is how the set of real numbers uh, looks like it can contain the negative numbers there's a minus 500, minus 500, point zero, point zero, zero, 0.001. Then there are a lot of negative numbers, 0, 1, 1.11. Or you can write 1.001, da, 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 1.1, da, 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 2, and so on. And what you can do, you can adapt the idea of real number line to visualize these things. Real number line. So the real number line is something like this. You draw a straight line and somewhere over here, you put a zero. And what you do is that you put all the integers or all the positive numbers, I mean the positive integers on right side, like this, in a single unit uh, distance. And we'll talk about distances in a few moments. But for now, uh, you can label them as such. Let's say you call this one, you call this two, three, four, five, six. And these decimal point numbers are in between these integers. Similarly, on the left hand side, you put all the negative numbers like this. Now, if you want to point out a number, let's say 1.5, how can you do that? Well, this is one and this is two. 1.5 is what? Greater than one, but less than two, right? So that means it will reside somewhere over here. Maybe this point can be denoted as 1.5. Similarly, if you want to indicate minus 2.5, that will lie between minus three and minus two. Let's say this point. You can indicate this point as minus 2.5. <coughs> and by unit distance, what I mean, well, this zero to one, this distance is called one unit. And we'll talk about it soon. 
uh, how do we really define it mathematically so yeah uh, any questions so far no sir, no, sir. Okay. No, sir. okay so what we can do is that we can now uh, try to classify real numbers or so to say classification of real numbers so this real numbers can be classified into two categories one is called the rational numbers the other one is called irrational numbers The set of rational numbers are denoted with a bold face Q. I don't know how to write it properly, but uh, it looks pretty in a, you know, if you were typing in some sort of a LaTeX or Word, but by hand, I want, I write it like this. Some people would write it like this, but I prefer this one. It really doesn't matter. So, um, and, the irrational numbers are the set of real numbers. Take the set of real numbers and you just get rid of all the rational numbers. Those are your irrational numbers. I don't remember right now whether there's a symbol to denote the set of irrational numbers, but I'll look it up and let you know if there is a specific symbol, but this is the definition. Like take all the real numbers then identify the rational guys and get rid of them. And the remaining set will be your irrational numbers. So let's talk about rational number first. So the rational numbers or the set of rational number would contain elements. Could you repeat the irrational numbers part again? <clears throat> okay. so. What you do, you take the set of real numbers, okay? And then take all the rational numbers and get rid of them. That means, you know, this symbol. Remember what this is? This is the set difference. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, this is instructing you to, you know, take all the rational numbers inside real numbers or the set of reals and then get rid of them. Whatever you have left are called irrational numbers. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, now we're talking about the definition of rational numbers. Well, let's say X is a rational number that belongs to this set Q. And X is a number such that this symbol, recall that this symbol, this vertical thing means such that. X can be written as P divided by Q where Q is not equals to zero because division by zero is not defined. And P and Q are co prime. What does co prime mean? Well, it means uh, P and Q have no factors in common. So this means P and Q have no factors in common apart from one. You know, one is trivial, so people usually don't mention it. So this is the set of, you know, rational numbers. Maybe I can show you some examples and that will clear things up. So let's take an example of, let's say x equals to two by three. this is a rational number why because two and three are co-primes or so to say two and three have no factors in common apart from one so this is one example in fact let's call it x1 uh, let's take another sample or so to say example like this five by two you can also express it in terms of decimals 
like 2.5, right? So this is also a rational number. Let's say I have a number like a uh, number that looks like this. One, six, 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 da, 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 da. That means uh, there is an infinite number of sixes after this one. And some people, what they do is that they just put a bar over here. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, something just popped up in my screen, maybe. So yeah, as I was saying. <clears throat> so this is also a rational number. That means you take this one, there is only single entry of one, but the sixes are just, you know, repeating itself. And you can show that this is, uh, this can be expressed in terms of fraction as well. You can show that. And let's say you have another number like this 2.10, zero two zero two zero two this there's a infinite pattern of the zero to zero to zero to zero to and so on this is also a rational number or you can express it like this one zero two like this one so from this examples uh we can draw a conclusion that uh this format of numbers, P and Q, where Q is not zero and P and Q are co-prime, they're rationals. But at the same time, if I give you some sort of a decimal point number, like the ones above X3 and X4, if you see that uh, there is a repetitive pattern or it terminates uh, at some point, at a finite point, or it shows a repetitive pattern, those are also rational numbers. You can take this thing, for example, 10 divided by three. What does this give us? I think it gives us 0 0.33333, right? Is this right? Yeah. 3.333. Oh, sorry, 3.333, thank you. Because 0 0.3, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. 3.33333, so yeah, this is also a rational number. What about one by three? This one gives you 0 0.333, right? I don't know. I forgot. To, I don't know how to divide things. Pull legacy. It take you check out the paro. One divided by three. This is indeed 0 0.333. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It should be this because one is. Zero, yeah, because so you need to put a zero. Three. Yeah, then put yeah. a dot. It becomes. So it is. Yes, yeah. sir. One three 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 three. So yeah. So these are all rational numbers. And what about integers? Uh, 2, 4, 6, minus 2, minus 1. Let's not talk about 0. There are some issues with zeros. Um, 2, 4, 6, minus 2, minus 1. What about these things? Are they rationals? Yeah, they are rational numbers. So if I want to express 2 as p by q, uh, what is p and what is q? Two and one, sir. Exactly. Yep. In fact, one and two are co-primes too. There is no factor, you know, common in between one and two apart from one. Okay. Okay, good. So now we understand rational numbers. We see that these integers are also part of rationals, right? From this thing. And this tells us that the set of integers form a subset <clears throat> of the rationals. The set of integers is denoted by Z, you know, write a Z and put a bold mark over here. Like, you know, yeah, that's Z or Z, whatever you want to call it. So this is a subset, in fact, a proper subset of the rational numbers. But the set of integers can be subdivided as well because the set of integers contains negative numbers, let's say 100, 
then there is zero, then there is one, two, three, da, 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 100 and so on, right? So you can even subdivide them into the set of positive integers and to the set of negative integers. And the positive integers will contain zero. I mean, there's, I think there is an argument between whether uh, you regard zero as a positive thing or a negative thing. Uh, but I think it's settled that you put zero in the set of positive integers. That's what I know so far. Sorry, there was someone waiting in the room and I didn't notice. So yeah, uh, so that's why I put zero in the set of positive integers. But yeah, there was an argument whether zero is a positive thing and a negative thing. Uh, I don't know how that argument, you know, came to a conclusion. It's a bit of a historical context, I guess. So I don't know about it much. And the set of negative integers are like this, minus one, minus two, and so on. So Z is already uh, a subset of the rationals, right? Or so to say, a proper subset. And this Z plus, or the set of positive integers, and the set of negative integers, they are what? They are a subset of the set of integers, right? So we can uh, recall one thing that we learned in sets is that if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then A is a subset of C, right? This is something I think I asked you guys to show. Maybe I left this thing as an exercise. I don't recall exactly, but I do recall about talking this thing in the class. So we can use that and say, oh, the set of positive integers, the set of negative integers, they also form a subset of the rationals. Okay. And let's now focus on the set of positive integers. Sometimes some people call them whole numbers and I have absolutely no idea why. I mean, an integer is integer, right? But what's so whole about it? I don't know. I have absolutely no idea why they call it whole numbers. I mean, the very concept of what do you mean by a whole? I mean, this means some sort of thing called like fulfilled or something. I don't know about it. Like, I have absolutely no idea why they call it a whole number. I would rather stick to the set of positive integers because if I say that, then I can say, oh, I'm talking about numbers like zeros, ones, two, and so on. I'm very precise about what I want to say. So that's why I like the idea of calling this the set of positive integers. But why they call it whole numbers, I don't know. You'll see this in the book, I think. In any college algebra book, uh, they will call it whole numbers. But if any of you can find out why they call it whole numbers, please let me know. Because I don't know. Yep. Uh, yeah, so, sir, yeah. Sir, I think I know the reason. Hmm. Well, well, sir, there is Amar Prothume Radiakti Chulo Mudache. One thicke infinity porjunto chilo natural number, zero thicke. Infinity is not a natural number. <laughs> infinity I is mean, not sir, a number. One, yeah. two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. Zero com, natural mm -hmm. number. Zero thicke, one, two, three, four, five, six, whole number. Yeah, they call the minus jokora hoi, tallest are the integer. I have a classification kora hoi chilo. Hmm, kinto reason taki, right? Manetumar, eight at the set of positive integer and negative integer of Hagaja. So zero is not natural number, karon zero the ashole. Oh, gee, the fundamental operation chigula, that be the act operation in the ill defined, but undefined, both the bottom, right? Oh, gee, zero they divide correct. I would take to pori the habo, but uh, that's fine. Natural number, I get it. Hang into it a whole number can of this. Man, what is so whole about it? Eight hour gas, I have no clear national. I made a positive integer. Huh? What does our dollars are scholar the Jigasha would do it? Can of the radi said course a whole number. Oh, scholar, na, maybe ask a, a mathematician, maybe. Maybe it's a terminology. deep meaning on terminology is not a historical context. So, maybe from there. But yeah, 
maybe i'm not sure i do have mathematicians when i mean jigesh korte bari but i never bother about this thing ashole khub ekta je tomader poraite eshe abar jinish ta mathay asche je eta keno whole number bolte so what's the reason behind it ha <coughs> but yeah let, let's just call them you know set a positive integer so it are beshi precise ba whole number je eta mon chai okay so as we were saying okay uh this set of positive integers we can even make subsets of this thing and one subset is called the natural numbers what is a natural number well the set of natural numbers are denoted by this n this bold okay it doesn't look good yeah this looks good um uh, an element of n let's call that x x belongs to take the set of positive integers and get rid of zero so that's the set of natural numbers so the elements of natural numbers will look something like this uh 1 2 3 and so on and why get rid of zero i can give you uh some sort of a reason on why we want to get rid of zero it's because um if you think about the basic arithmetic operations that is addition multiplication division and subtraction you can uh, do this three operations with zero as well you know take any number apart from zero then you are good you are good to go you can do all of these stuffs but if you consider an operation by zero let's say let's add two numbers let's say some number 1 1 plus 0 is what 1 One times zero is what zero. One minus zero is what one, or zero minus one is just you know minus one or something. But when it comes to division, uh, let's say you have any number, let's say five, and you want to divide by zero, then you ask the question, what is the result? Well, it is not defined. In other words. nobody knows in other words invalid so whenever we say that it is not defined you can just say oh if it's not defined we cannot do it that's it so that's why people get rid of zero and you know call this subset a set of natural numbers okay so that you can do all four of these operations with them that's a reason uh might not be a very concrete one but uh should give you some sort of an intuition into why we want to get rid of zero when we are calling it a natural number and stuff like that uh all right so any questions so far Uh, sir is undefined and infinity the same thing no no infinity uh means something very large huh? because what is infinite let's just say you take a very 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 large number right like let's say google to the uh, google plex to the power google plex maybe if you don't know what a google plex is uh, look it up uh yeah uh so and you what you can do is that you can take a very 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 large number and you can always add something more to that because once you quantify what that number is you can always add something and get another number so uh, the informal concept of infinity is like uh something that you know blows up like it's so big you cannot just comprehend it and uh infinity is a part of the extended real line not the real line that we saw you know it's never there but at the same time uh, it sort of helps you to compute stuff 
and division by zero is something that is not defined that means we don't know how to do it because if you uh, take this example and you want to do like this you know the way we were taught in kindergartens or high schools what can i do over here i want to divide five with by zero right so let's take one so this is zero i get five again but now what let's say instead of one i want to write two two times zero is also zero i get five again right then i want to say yeah. 300 300 times zero is also zero i get five so doesn't make any sense and anyone can do anything you can pop out any result you want and that doesn't make sense logically so that's why we call it not defined in other words we don't know what to do or you know it's just not possible to divide something by zero so to say so that's why we say it's not defined so undefined and infinity is uh no they are not the same thing <clears throat> but uh maybe when you do calculus you'll see things like this there is a one upon zero while this thing is undefined you might see things like this let's say x x minus three and uh, if somehow x approaches three this arrow means approaches but approaches is not equals to that equal sign okay approaches doesn't mean equals to so approach means the value of x can go very 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 close to three and when that happens you say that this result is tending to infinity it's not infinity what you really mean is that the result is blowing up if you consider a graph instead of x by x minus 3 i think uh, plotting 1 upon x minus 3 will be easier for me so <clears throat> when your x goes to 3 this will uh, okay how does this graph look like okay so this is 3 let's say and the graph will look something like this so when x approaches 3 what happens is that the value of this thing is very 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 large and at x equals to 3 the value is undefined it's not infinity it approaches a very large number and by this infinity symbol we really meant meant that you know the value is blowing up yeah uh, does that answer your question uh, yes, uh, I mean, basically, they are two opposite spectrums. Uh, not opposite, different. I would say different. Uh, I'm not sure whether we can call uh, them opposites. Uh, uh, thank you. Okay, so I think someone raised a hand. Uh, can you speak up? I think your I didn't saw the name. There was just an ID number. um sir i yeah. have a question yeah what do you mean by blowing up i actually didn't get the concept mm, blowing up means it's approaching towards a very 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 large value more than you can imagine more than the oh. number of atoms in the universe or the size of the universe yeah <coughs> yeah so these and are the sir, things there that... is another thing hmm. okay. when you are talking about infinity you said something google complex or something like that google plex word. yeah it's a very large google plex yeah i mean will i guess it a value i mean sir it's a search this google plex a kind of google complex oh i don't know google i think google it's google called google, google plex or something like that but yeah but look up for some large numbers i mean one like number i said but oh. infinity concept uh, ah, okay, and I'm infinity concept actually it's all about you know whether your expression blows up or not to me to the infinity 
এটা কাজ করে না আর কি আরেকটা স্যার আরেকটা জিনিস ছিল হোল নাম্বার এর এখানে একটা এক্সপ্লেনেশন দিয়েছে কেন হোল নাম্বার হুম ওকে সো হোয়াটস দ্য এক্সপ্লেনেশন আই ডোন্ট নো বলো আমারে এনি পজিটিভ নাম্বার দ্যাট ডাজ নট ইনক্লুড এ ফ্র্যাকশন অর ডিসিমাল পার্ট দা মিনি কিন্তু সেটা তো হোল দা নাম্বার 0124567 আই উইল টু রিসার্চ পুরো না আর দা হোল নাম্বার নাম্বার সাচ এস মাইনাস 3 2.7 অর 3 বাই হাফ আর নট হোল নাম্বার মানে স্যার এখানে বোঝাচ্ছে ওইটা পুরো একটাই নাম্বার ওইটার সাথে কোনো মাইনাসও নাই পয়েন্টও নাই আর ওটার কোনো ই ও নাই ওটার সাথে 3.1 বাই 2 এরকম না মানে ফ্র্যাকশন তো আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ডেবল রাইট মানে তুমি ইন্টিজার মাইনাসও নাই এটার সাথে হ্যাঁ মাইনাসও নাই এই কারণে এটা শুধু একটা নাম্বার হয় 0 অথবা 1 2 13 এগুলার মানে আশেপাশে কিছু নাই তাই হোল নাম্বার দিয়ে দিয়েছে তারা এটারে ও আচ্ছা ওকে দ্যাটস এ ভেরি গুড এটা বুঝতে পারতেছি আর 0 কি হোল নাম্বার হ্যাঁ बड़ा <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, ठीक है सर अच्छा thank you for sharing uh, whole number है रोटा माने fraction तो ना रोटा बुझ आए जाए common sense की तो माने minus रहो जो तारा एक ता you know object ऐसा भी देख सो रोटा शोले आमे बुझ ही नहीं चाहिए ओक हाँ समझना है but it's a ठीक है सर एक ता acceptable explanation so रोटा share करो जो ना thanks आ अच्छा ठीक है सर हम लोग उन्नो देखे distracted हो जाते सी so so far आर कोनो questions हैं सर if not तो ले आमे एक ता summary draw करी so the summary for you know your rational numbers or the classification of rational numbers is the following cheta hocche ki um what i can do oh. the set of rational numbers q i can have the integers which is you know where the integers are a subset of the rational numbers then i can have set of positive integers negative integers and from there uh i can have what uh natural numbers right and that's pretty much uh you know that's pretty much it about the rational numbers and their classifications and now let's talk about irrational numbers what are irrational numbers anything that is not rational or any real number that is not a rational number so uh let's take an example okay so square root of 2 can anyone uh, tell me you know with the help of a calculator what are the first few digits of square root of 2 to 1.4142 1.4142 1.4142 but can you tell me some more digits One three five six two. One three five six two. Okay, so uh, you know, on an ordinary calculator, or uh, you know, uh, you can obviously get uh, what like ten decimal points and stuff like that. So, uh, if you take more points, uh, then you will see that uh, unlike the rational numbers, where you know after decimal you will get a either you will get some sort of a termination. or you know a certain pattern uh in terms of this number it will never stop it will go on and on and on so this type of numbers are called irrational numbers or in other words you cannot express them in p by q format so uh 
square root over three, square root over five, square root over seven, square root over eight. These are all irrational numbers. In fact, you can write a square root over eight as four times two, right? And then you can break it down by writing like this. Square root over four is just two, but this guy over here ruins everything up. So that's why this thing is also a rational number, stuff like that. In fact, uh, let me do something for you, uh, just to show you that, uh, let me see if I can get it done first and, yep, I can get it done. So uh, let me share my screen with you. Uh, I mean, I'm on a tab, but this will temporarily stop my screen from the tablet, I think. So take a look at this guy over here. This is the square root of a two. And, you know, all these numbers you see, in total, there are 500 numbers after decimal point. What about 5,000? You won't see any pattern over here. Not a single pattern at all, okay? But if you... Uh, don't worry about the software that I'm using to do these things. But if you take 1 upon 3, or let's say... Not 1 upon 3, let's take something more that is not, you know not that obvious so six by five that should be a rational number right because they are co-primes so let's take 500 digits of this number see it terminates at two okay so that's not a very good example let's take something else what about three okay three won't work because that will end up at 1.6 maybe uh, 0.6 yeah so can anyone tell me a good example you know, that will not terminate that fast. What about seven by nine? Oh, damn, it's another pattern. Yeah, but yeah, I think you can now see the difference. Like um, if you take a look at this guy, you won't get any sort of a termination or any sort of a repetitive pattern. So that's why we say, you know, this square root of a two is a irrational number. And, you know, stuff like this, they always terminate or show uh, some sort of a pattern. And you can see at the fifth, uh, 500 digit, uh, it showed me that, oh, there's an eight, but it's not eight, really. It's just turncating all the other sevens that are there. If you take 5,000 digits, see, sevens all the way around and this ellipsis, that means there are more sevens there. So yeah, another example of irrational number is the natural constant pi. Sorry, I wrote psi by mistake. And if you take three digits or four digits, I think you all know that 3.142, what about 400? You won't see any pattern. Or, you know, there's another number called, you guys will say it a lot. Um, I don't know the proper English term for it, but Bangla Itake Chokro Bithi Har Bola Hai. Interest, Chokro Bithi Har Jita. Cyclic interest, maybe, I don't know. So, the Euler's constant. So, this is another example of irrational number and you won't get any repetitions or any sort of a pattern after the decimal point. Neither it will terminate ever. It will go on and on and on. <clears throat> so yeah, these are your, you know, irrational numbers. Mm, any questions so far? No, sir. Okay, good. So let me get back to my tab screen. All right, cool. So we now know about rational and irrational numbers. And one final remark is that 
the quantity of irrational numbers is greater than the rationals. Uh, I don't think we talked about the real number line that much, right? Like we just introduced it, but you know, uh, let me just try to um, give you an intuition what this remark really means. Well, if you draw a real line like this and uh, let's take any number one and a number two. So in between this, uh, Okay, this is a bad, bad contrast, bad contrast, yeah. uh, let me switch to something else. In between these two numbers, there are many numbers, right? Uh, and some of them are rational, some of them are irrational. Let's say I take a number like 1.5, which really means a three by two. This is a rational number, right? And there is a theorem that says um, between two rationals, there is always an irrational number. And uh, by using that theorem, obviously it can be proven. And by using that, what you can show is that just between one and 1 1.5, uh, the numbers of, I mean, the quantity of irrational numbers will exceed the quantity of rationals. So as a result, uh, the irrational numbers are, you know, they have abundance in nature or so to say, more than the rationals. Their abundance is, you know, more prevalent. So yeah, that's pretty much it about, you know, talking about rational and irrational numbers. Any more questions? If not, uh, I want to move into some one dimensional geometry or, you know, basic geometry. Let's not call it one dimensional, let's call it basic geometry. Okay, by the way, uh, if you don't understand any uh, terminology, uh, do ask, all right? I do understand that uh, some of the terminologies are new and it might be a bit hard to uh, grasp them. So if you don't understand uh, the terminologies or, you know, the meaning of anything, the meaning of words that I'm using, just let me know. <coughs> so what is geometry? Well, uh, I can say that our uh, geometry is a subject that cares about distance. As a subject or, a, you know, subfield or topic that, cares about distance. In other words, what you can say is that this distance thing, which we haven't defined yet, uh, but we will soon, is some sort of a fundamental building block of geometry. But I guess you have done some geometry, like you have found out what areas of a triangle, rectangle, squares, trapezoids, then uh, cylinders, volumes of cylinders, and so on. But all those things, uh, they will uh, depend on the notion of a distance. So areas, volumes, etc. They all depend on the notion of a distance. With that in mind, let us define distance or what we mean by distance in one dimension. What is one dimension? Well, uh, just take an example of the real number line, okay? You can either move in this way or that way. So you are confined on a line. So that's what I mean by 1D or one dimension or that also means one degree of freedom. So uh, let's say uh, I have two numbers. Since we are talking about the real line, okay, so 1D means in our context, it will mean the real number line or the real line. 
it's I have two points that belongs to the real number line. And if I want to draw a picture, let's say this is X1, this is X2. And I want to define a distance between these two points. So far, they're just points. So the distance will be defined as follows. Let's say I'm calling it dx1 comma x2. This is a notation just to denote the fact that I'm, you know, denoting a distance between these two points. And this is given by these two vertical bars, which are called modulus. I'll explain what modulus is. Like this. So now I think I need to explain what a modulus is. Sometimes it's also called the absolute value of something that resides inside these bars. So let me show you an example. Modulus of x is equals to x. Modulus of minus x is also equals to x. So what does this modulus mean? Well, it means the absolute value. Uh, let's say you have something like this. 2 minus 3 plus 5. And you want to take a modulus of it. So in general, what you can do is that 2 minus 3 plus 5 gives you what? You can carry out these uh, operations in any order you want, right? So this will just give you 7 minus 3. This gives you 4. Okay, so we have a modulus of 4, which is just 4. But uh, let's take this example, but now we vary things a little bit. Instead of three, let's say 30. And let's say five. How about this one? So wh whatever is inside the modular sign, the rule of thumb is to, you know, carry out those operations inside the modulus first, and then apply this condition that defines the modular symbol or the modular operation. So this is what, this is minus 30 plus seven, right? So this is modulus of minus, what, 23? But the modulus of minus 23 is just 23. So this symbol or the modulus symbol um, tells us to take the absolute value of the In other words, get rid of the minus sign from the final result. That's what a modulus sign does. And with the help of this modulus sign, we define the distance between two points on the real number line as follows. X1, X2, okay. Now let's take a numerical example so that you can understand. Let's take X1 equals to 50, X2 equals to two. So in this case, D of 50 comma two, it's not necessary to write things like this. Uh, if you can uh, make things clear from the context, that's fine. It's just a notation I'm adopting for this class. That's all. Notation can vary from people to people. So this is just 50 minus two, which is modulus of 48, which is just 48, right? What about a point, let's say minus five to two. So this means minus five minus two. This is minus seven. By the virtue of modulus sign, we get rid of the minus sign. And that means the distance is seven. So what does this really mean? So again, draw the real number line. Let's say um, this is minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two. So what does this seven imply really? 
Well, it means that minus five is located uh, seven units from two, or so to say two is located uh, seven units from minus five. How can we see that? Pretty easy. This is one unit, this is one unit, this is one unit, and so on, like this. Well, I mean, think of a guy who can jump only one unit at a time. So he has to jump like seven times. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, just to reach from two to minus five or vice versa, minus five to two, really doesn't matter, same stuff. Uh, any questions so far? No, sir. Okay. And let me know if I'm going too fast. Uh, oh, I only have... Uh, 30 minutes, I guess, not 30, but 20 minutes. There are tons of things I need to do. So I'll be going a little bit fast, uh, sorry. I'm introducing distance, so I'll talk about polynomials uh, later. But do you understand the concept of, concept of distance now, at least in one dimension or on the real number line? Yes. Okay, so yes, sir. this is a thing I um, want you guys to do. I mean, try it out. Note that in-class exercises are not mandatory. There will be no submissions for this. If you try it out, you want to talk about it, uh, we can do that, but this is not, you know, some sort of official homework or stuff like that. I'll give this, I'll try to give this in-class exercises, okay? So for the exercise, I want you to sh uh, use the modulus property to show that D of X12 is D of X21. And what is the hint over here? Well, D was defined with the modulus symbol, X1 minus X2. So try to uh, do this thing. Uh, and let me know if you need, uh, you know, if you need to talk about it or, you know, discuss about it. Maybe in the next class we can do that. <clears throat> so that's the concept of distance. Uh, that concludes the concept of distances for this lecture in one dimension. And I'll just present a result that is on two dimensions, but I'll not prove it right now. Uh, we'll prove it uh, when we study functions, coordinate systems, and so on, because I need to introduce those things before I introduce the concept of distance. In fact, even in one dimension, this is a coordinate system, but I haven't ex mentioned that explicitly because it's gonna confuse you and it's gonna take a lot of time. So I'll do that later, but not on this lecture. So this is a very brief talk about 2D geometry. And again, we uh, define the notion of distance in two dimensions. Why two dimensions? Well, just think of this screen that you are um, seeing right now. If a bug lands on it, it can either go in this direction, you know, the horizontal directions, or it can go into vertical directions, right? Independently. So in that sense, he has two degrees of freedom. Okay? So that's why it's called a 2D. So what we can do is that we can uh, take a 2D system. Uh, we can take an origin that's labeled by zero, zero. This means the X coordinate, Y coordinate. Obviously I uh, didn't introduce the coordinates, but bear with me for now. I'll make things more clear later on. When we discuss about coordinate geometry, all of this will make sense, okay? And let's take a point P that is denoted by X and Y. What you can do, you can draw a line like this. And once you draw a line, you can define some sort of a distance. Let's say capital D of X, Y. And this capital D of X, Y will be given by X square, Y square, square root. Okay. Why this is important? Well, if we cannot define uh, distances in 2D or 3D geometry, we won't be able to compute the lengths of a 
let's say at the arm length of a triangle. If we cannot do that, we cannot, you know, obviously compute the base and the height. So as a result, uh, we won't be able to compute the areas. Let's say uh, in 3D, you have a cylinder like this. So again, first of all, you need to define a notion of distance first. You need to know how to compute distances. Once you do that, only then you can compute the surface areas and the volumes as well. And these are geometrical quantities. So this is just a brief, you know, uh, you know, more like a storytelling thing. Don't worry about it if you don't understand it right now. Uh, in time with the course, everything will be clear. But for now, I want you to focus on this guy, uh, the notion of distance on one dimension. Uh, any questions so far? No, sir. Okay, so, okay, nice. So we still have time uh, and I want to go to my last topic for today. And those are called polynomials. Uh, it's called in Bengali, it's called Buhu Bodhi, I think. This is how you read Buhu Bodhi, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, what is a polynomial? Well, uh, instead of uh, giving a formal definition, let me just uh, show you what a polynomial is. Let's say uh, I have a variable, x. What I can do right now is that I can uh, form an object. That object will look something like this and I'll explain term by term what these things are. This is a polynomial. So what is this? It's a, you know, combination of stuffs. What stuffs? These A's over here, let's call them AIs, are called coefficients. The powers of x, that means all these m's, let's denote them with mi, where i can run from 1, 2, 3. For example, m1 is just m, m2 is m minus 1, m3 is m minus 2, and so on. All these things are, you know, m, m minus 1, m minus 2, da, 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 up until 0. These are called exponents. And finally, these x's are called variables. Once you combine these three, like, you know, this sort of a fashion, this will be called a polynomial. So poly means many. So you have many terms like this. What's a common example of a polynomial? Well, take this quadratic example, to x plus one. Now you might say, oh, where is this one coming from? We should have x to the power zero at the end, right? But one is what? One times x to the power zero? Or instead of one, if you write five, you can always write it as, five times x to the power zero because x to the power zero means x to the power m divided by x to the power m, which really means x to the power m minus m. And this is just one.
So this is an example of a polynomial. And how do we read these things off? Well, uh, let's say you have a polynomial like this that is inside this white box or something. First of all, you look for the highest power of the variable. In this case, this is a this is the highest power of what m. So we will call it a m degree polynomial. So uh, the way to read or you know to call the polynomials is to look for the highest power in the exponent exponent of the variable for example uh, let's say this is 3x cubed plus 4x to the power 100 plus 2 this is also a polynomial and this is a hundredth order polynomial. And you might ask what happened to all the other terms. Well, if you notice, you can write it like this, right? Zero times x to the power 99, zero times x to the power 98 and so on. You know, all the coefficients up until uh, three comes. 3 x to the power 3 because if you want to have x to the power 4 that would also be multiplied by 0 and all the terms are in between this line these ellipses and then uh, it will be 0 times x squared 0 times x plus 2 times x to the power 0 so all the terms are really there but you know the because of the coefficients are 0 they just don't contribute anything. Does this make any sense? If not, please ask. So can you repeat one more? So uh, if I talk about this example over here, I think this is clear why it's called a hundred order polynomial right like a hundredth of order because the highest exponent is 100 right now if i want to compare this with the standard definition that we provided here you may ask okay what happened to the terms like x to the power 99 x to the power 98 and so on right because you don't see them here so that's what i wrote like you don't see the x to the power 99, x to the power 98, and terms like that because the coefficients are zero. I mean, if you just look at this, let's say this a2, a3, if they are zero, then the whole thing becomes zero, right? It's like zero times x to the power m minus one, that is what, zero. Zero times anything is zero, right? And these are all zeros in this case, in these examples. So this is zero plus this is zero, and there are many zeros in between. So that's why we don't write them up because adding zero means adding no value at all. Take anything and add a zero. It becomes the same thing, right? It stays the same, it doesn't change. So yeah, that's why we write it like this because all the coefficients of the other terms like it's 99 98 80 87 all of them are zero and the reason they are zero because it's not there you just compare this example with the standard expression and from that comparison you can understand that the coefficients have to be zero <coughs> does that uh, help or you know answer your question or you know any confusions so far i think everyone is confused right or naki too much for one day 
Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, if it's too much for one day, there is one last thing I want to talk about, then I will stop. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is the, you know, the definition of polynomials and all this stuff. So one last thing I want to talk about uh, briefly is the roots of a polynomial. Let's say I want to write a polynomial like p of x as, let's say, ax squared, um, not ax squared, okay, so, um, let's take an example. Let's just do it by example. Let's say um, x squared minus 2x plus 1. This is a polynomial, right? And this is a second degree polynomial. Why? Because the highest power of the exponent in the variable is 2. <clears throat> uh, so what is the root of a polynomial? Let's say y is a root of a polynomial. By polynomial, I mean this one. So let me write polynomial p of x. So if y is a root, how do we identify it, right? I'm just saying y is a root, but what does this root mean? Well, it satisfies the following. P of y will be equals to zero. That means if you put y in the place of x, you will get a zero. Let me show you how. So P of X is what? X squared minus twice X plus one. Now I want you to check whether one or two, that means whether X equals to one or X equals to two is a root of the polynomial P of X. How do you check it? Well, let's say check for x equals to 2, you just put the value of x inside this polynomial over here. So the value of x is what? 2. And we have to put this inside the polynomial. So this is just 2 squared minus 2 times 2 plus 1. So this is 4 minus 8 plus 1, which is something, but which is not 0. This is actually 5 minus 8, which is minus 3. And that is not equals to 0, right? So since x equals to 2 doesn't yield p of x equals to 0, x equals to 2 is not a root of p of x, or so to say the polynomial. But if you now check for x equals to 1, you can easily see that this is just one, sorry, one square minus two times one plus one. One plus one minus two, this is zero. So you can conclude that x equals to one is a root of the polynomial P of x. So what are these roots? Well, roots are just factors. Uh, roots can help you find factors of a polynomial and these stuffs will be you know pretty important when we talk about algebras and my plan i mean for today i'm done i know it's too much for you for a single day but just get the idea you don't have to understand you know all the things at this instant just get the idea like what is the root right you don't have to know how to find this at this instant, but just get the idea of what is a root, okay? It's some value that makes the polynomial, you know, zero or stuff like that. If you put in the value, you get a zero out of the polynomial. So I'm done for today. And uh, let me just uh, talk briefly about uh, what I want to do in the next class is that I briefly want to introduce complex numbers because I don't think you need it much so I'll be, you know, just touching the surface on complex numbers. And then uh, 
we have uh, three more classes this week, right? So after tomorrow, um, there will be two more classes. And in those two classes, uh, I'll talk about algebra, the basic algebra, because I do think you need a solid foundation in your algebraic skills. Without that, uh, you won't be able to do anything like calculus, math, uh, linear algebra, all the courses that you'll need to take in future, especially for if you are someone from economics or you know uh, you have an intention of becoming an accountant someday, you will need these things. You need to have a very solid algebra foundation. So that's the plan for now. So any questions so far? from today's discussion. I know it's it was a bit hectic, but uh, yeah, any questions so far? Sir, I'm going to say that pop quiz is going to be old. I'm going to solve it. Uh, you can try to solve them. Um, uh, I'll give you pop quizzes after uh, this week. I mean, uh, there are three more classes. So after three more classes, you'll get pop quizzes. Uh, you can try to, you know, practice those things just for fun or, you know, some sort of exercise, but it's not mandatory to answer the old pop quizzes. Uh, okay, sir. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> So any more math uh, math questions? If not, uh, I'll stop the recording. Uh, sir. Hmm? Polynomial root by value guess There is a systematic way. There is a systematic way, but uh, that systematic way only works for quadratic equations and in some cases cubic equations. There is a systematic way. I'll teach you how to do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, okay, yeah. So if you see any quadratic equation uh, in the form of, let's say, ax squared plus bx plus c, this is also a polynomial, right? And if you want to find the root, you have to find such x's that will make it zero. So this is just solving this quadratic equation. You know, all of these ideas, they might seem disjoint to each other, but they are just connected. Yeah, I'll teach you how to do these things. There is a systematic way that exists for quadratic stuff. And I do think there is a exact solution for cubic polynomials. But uh, if I go, you know, higher order, let's say fourth order, fifth order, sixth order, it gets very, very, very difficult. And you don't have to worry about those things. For you guys, I think cubic is more than good enough. Okay, so any more math questions? Anybody? Okay, if not, uh, I'll just stop the recording here.